morning because I was struggling with two ideas and one of them I wanted to share, but I thought maybe I would share it at our watch night service, which is Friday. But then I decided against it because I, I really felt this is what the Lord wanted me to speak on. But part of, I guess, the problem I was having was that the topic we're going to talk about today is, is often very um, mistaught. People don't teach it right. And so at the, I, guess I, I, I thought I might start setting people on edge if I start saying this is what I'm going to talk about because they'll automatically think about that particular thing. But the Bible teaches what we're going to talk about today. So I want to try and tether everything I say to the Bible. Because if I don't, then you shouldn't listen to me. But... This topic has been taught a lot in churches, and it's been taught wrong to, to the point where whenever you talk about it, now people think um, something is wrong with you when you say it. If you say it to all, oh, you one of those people, especially if you come from a good Bible teaching church, you hear this and you start, you start feeling a little weird. So this is, this is my, the, the title of my sermon today. It's this, God wants to bless your socks off. Somebody's like, okay. God wants to bless. I believe 2011 is going to be a year that God blesses your socks off or your socks on if you don't if you don't have them on. I I believe that. Now, one of the things that happens when you start talking about this, you you automatically are hearing all those sermons that you heard on TV where dudes start telling you, if you poor, then God's not with you. <laughs> if you shop at the dollar store, God's not with you. I shop at the dollar store. Hey, amen. Soap for a dollar? Oh, man. <laughs> Toothpaste? Plates? Cups? <laughs> All that stuff, man. And I fast. I still believe I'm blessed. <laughs> but they'll tell you, you're, you're not blessed if you don't have money. You're, you're not blessed if um, you struggle paying your bills. You're not blessed if you need some help from mom and dad give you some money every now and then. You're not blessed. That's, that's not a biblical perspective on blessing. Now, before we talk about this, I want to define the word blessing. The word blessed in the Bible means happy. That's what it means. It means happy. In some places, it's tr it should be translated, oh, the happiness of this type of person. So blessedness or being blessed means you're happy. Now, usually when you're happy about something, or usually when you're happy, you have this emotion of ha happiness. What's going on in your life? Everything is good. Because when people talk about blessing, oftentimes they're thinking of material things. I'm blessed, that means I got money in my wallet or in my bank account, which I don't have any now because of Christmas. It's all gone. But people think blessing means having stuff, but they're kind of right in the sense that you are blessed when you have good things. You ever just woken up in the morning and it's just one of those days that just everything is just going perfect? You wake up in the morning and you're not tired. You go, you, you brush your teeth, the toothpaste tastes good. You go downstairs, you make yourself breakfast, everything is nice. You get in your car, you drive, there's a little bit of traffic, your car is filled up all the way. You get to work and everybody's smiling at you just like this is, I'm happy. And then you have those other days where you just wake up like, gosh, what's my life? Come, Lord Jesus. In the, in, the, in the morning, nothing even happened yet. You woke up mad. You have those days, but there are some days you wake up and you are just happy. That's what it means to be blessed. Now, we live in a world that is full of sin. We live in a world that is riddled with 
evil and wickedness and it's diseased, it's broken. And Jesus says that all of us will face tribulation. All of us will face trouble. So these teachers who tell you, you will need to be blessed, and if you love God, you know God, you'll be blessed, that means you will have no trouble. Don't read their Bibles. Because Jesus says very clearly, you will have tribulation. The, the disciple or the servant is not greater than his master. And the master got crucified. What's going to happen to you? You ain't greater than him. So blessing, when we talk about blessing, it is not this idea that every single thing in your life is going to go well. Some of you, you miss payments for rent. Some of you ran out of gas this year. Some of you had to move because you didn't have the money. Some of you got sick this year. Some of you had relationship issues. Does that mean you're not blessed? Jesus didn't promise you you wouldn't get you. Jesus never promised that you would have everything go well in your life. But this is what I, I want to tell you. In spite of all that, we still serve a God who can tell your storm, be quiet. He can tell every disease, leave. And that's the God we serve. So in the midst of your storm, in the midst of your issues, trust God. Because this is how God, I believe, has designed the world to work. Him at the center, and as he's at the center, he lavishes gifts on us. Look at Genesis. Remember, he gives Adam and Eve this whole garden, and he says, I give you all these trees. Come on, look, look at all that. Look at all that. Don't eat from this one. This is it. Just this one. And that's the one they were just like, ooh, look at all this. Look at, but look at this one. You ever tell a kid, don't touch something? And they're just like, mm. That's the one they want to touch. But God, he gave them so much, so much. But the Bible says he walked with them in the cool of the day. Fellowship. There was love. There was communication. So he gave Adam and Eve himself, and then he also gave them stuff. So he said, come walk with me, and as you're walking with me, take an apple and eat it. Not the one from the tree, but eat an apple or a fruit. We don't know what the fruit was on the tree, so don't think I'm saying it was an apple. It's not. But as he's walking, he said, eat, have whatever you want, and you have me. See, so blessing in our lives, first of all, is we have God. And then once we have God, he gives us blessings, material things, financial. He gives us cars. He gives us houses, land, relationships, all that stuff. And I believe that is what God wants to do in our church this year. Now, having said that, there are some prerequisites. So this is not a blank check. You handing out blessings this morning, I heard, no. <laughs> there are some, some preliminaries that I need to deal with. So if you have a Bible, turn to Psalm 1. This, this is a psalm we all know. Some of you probably haven't memorized. Psalm 1. And I always like to say this, know that Whenever you're talking about one psalm, there's no S at the end. So you hear people say, Psalms 1. No, there's only one Psalm 1. When you're talking about the whole book or multiple psalms, then you say Psalms. So Psalms 2, 3, 4, and 5, or the book in Psalms, you use that S. When you're talking about one, don't use the S. I'm just saying, because <laughs> some of y'all still do it. Yeah, exactly. Psalm 1. If you're there, say, I'm, get, I'm there. If you just got there, say, I'm there now. <laughs> Good. Verse 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff 
that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. I'm going to be speaking from the first three verses, not really going to go into verses four and six. I'm going to allude to them. But if you want to be blessed, there's three things that I want to point out, three points. Um, blessed people and then the point. So um, this is what characterizes those who are blessed. And if you don't uh, possess these characteristics, these are things that you need to implement into your life in order to be blessed. So number one, blessed people steer clear of sin. Blessed people steer clear of sin. Now the psalmist lays it out three ways that we can be tripped up by sin. So the first one is the advice of the wicked. The blessed person steers clear, stays away from the advice of the wicked. Look at verse 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. The counsel, that word means advice. If you've ever gotten advice from someone, then you know exactly what this means. The psalmist says, those who are blessed do not listen to the advice of the wicked. Now, the wicked are people who habitually break God's commandments and don't care because everybody in this room breaks God's commandments. But the difference between you is that you care and you repent. But there are those who are wicked who do not care about God's law and they habitually break them. And the psalmist says, if you are blessed, you should not take the advice of the wicked. Now, if you're like me, you said, now, wait a minute. Are you saying that if somebody's not saved, they couldn't help me with a problem that I had? I mean, hasn't God given everybody wisdom and knowledge and understanding? I don't understand how my friend, he's got a PhD. He has all these degrees. How could he not help me? Well, listen, unbelievers have wisdom. Unbelievers have knowledge, but they do not have Jesus. That is a problem. There are some things an unbeliever can give you advice on. You want to know something about law, they can help you. You want to know something about science, they can help you. If you have some sort of issue with your car, go to a mechanic. If you have medical issues, go to a doctor. Do not, because some people are like, well, I need my doctor to be Christian. No, I say, I need my doctor to be trained. He could be a Buddhist. I, as long as you can fix me, know, know your craft. <laughs> Let me come in there. I'll just, let's just pray, because I don't know what's wrong with you. <laughs> Everybody like, I need a Christian plumber. I need a Christian. Just somebody who knows what they are doing. That's all you need. So you can ask people who are not saved to give you advice about things, but there are certain things like moral things and ethical things that you have to see from a biblical perspective. There are some people who will tell, for example, you're a guy, you're at work, you're at school, and there's a girl, she's beautiful, she's pretty, and um, you're like, hey, man, like, look at her. He's like, yeah. Like, should I, should I talk to her? He's like, well, yeah. Doesn't know Jesus. He's like, she's pretty. That's all you need. She's pretty. Now, if you were talking to a, a Christian, what would they say? Does she know Jesus? <laughs> Do you know Jesus? See, because an unbeliever doesn't, they don't care about your relationship with God. All they care about is measurements. How does she look? How does she look with makeup off? How does she look with makeup on? Those are the things the world cares about. But it says, look. The Bible says beauty fades. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to look at me. It do? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yes, your beauty will fade. <laughs> you will look in the mirror one day and be like, oh. <laughs> it, will <laughs> it, will <laughs> it will fade. But, but those who know Jesus have they see through Christ's spectacles, and they can see things from a perspective that a non-believer can't see. And they will tell you things like, no, she needs to know Jesus. Oh, should I be a little dishonest on this? I'll make a little bit of money. They'll say, no, you need to be honest. 
And there are people who don't know Christ who can tell you a lot about law, a lot about medicine, but when it comes to certain moral and ethical things, they will tell you wrong. And sometimes, even in those areas of law and those kind of things that seem more secular, an, a believer can give you great insight. There's one story in the Bible in Acts 27 where Paul, he's a prisoner, and they're sailing, and they're getting ready to hit a storm. At least they think there's a storm. And the Roman centurion asked the pilot, well, what do you think? Do you think, you know, if we sail on, we'll be cool? He's like, ah, yeah, I think we'll be cool. Paul's like, you know what, I, we're not going to be okay. Something's going to happen if we keep sailing. We need, to, we need to put the anchor down and just wait. And the centurion listened to the pilot and went ahead. Guess what happened? Shipwreck. Now, you should say, well, Paul, he wasn't a sailor. He didn't know what he was talking about. He made tents and preached. That's all he did. But yet God gave him this special insight. So you might have a medical issue. You might have a law issue. When, whenever we have medical issues in my house, my mom usually has some sort of uh, herbal remedy. It's like, Mom, I have, <laughs> I have a headache. Oh, take some cod liver oil and just, you know. <laughs> And that might be better than, you know, whatever else I'm going to take from the doctor. You don't know. But the idea is that those who don't know Jesus, those who don't know God, the psalmist says you need to steer clear of their advice because more often than not, they're going to lead you in the wrong direction. So the second thing, not just the advice of the wicked, he also says from the behavior of sinners or their actions. So their advice and now their action. Look again at verse 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the, wicked, of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners. Now, this speaks of the behavior of sinners, how they live, how they act, their behavior. The way that unbelievers live affect us. Um, the way they live is like kryptonite to our faith. You ever see Superman when he's doing his thing and bullets are coming, bouncing off, he's punching people, he's flying everywhere, bring some kryptonite in there. That strong dude, he was doing everything, you bring some kryptonite, he's like, ah, oh, man, can't do anything. And some people, when you get around non-believers and they're living and they're acting, your faith is affected. You're strong now in church. You love Jesus now in church. Get around some people who don't love him and, and how easy it is to just be like, yeah. There's, there, there is something about being around those who don't know Christ. Because remember, you used to not know him either. And you still have a sinful nature. And you still struggle with that. So some of you, I have some friends who are saved now say, I cannot be around my friends when they smoke weed. Because I will be affected by that. And I will want to do it. It's so crazy how you can be so affected by the way people live. When I was in high school, I, I, I wasn't a swear. I did not cuss. But whenever I would go back to school from summer, it was like I'd be in the, in the circle and we'd be talking and I'd, be, and I'd say a, a curse word. My friends would be like, <laughs> and I'd be like, what? Trying to act like, like you know, I, I knew what I was doing. I didn't even know how to cuss right. They just, you know, that's not like you. Or when I played football, they had me returning punts. And so they kicked the ball way up in the, in the air. I hated doing it. And during practice, sometimes I would drop the ball. And I would let out an expletive. And my coach is like, that's not appropriate, Mr. Okoyan. <laughs> like, I was like the, I wasn't even in ministry. I was like the team reverend already. Like people thought, people thought like, oh, he, he doesn't swear, he doesn't do all this stuff. But how crazy it was when I got around those people, it affected the way I live. You think I can hang around these unbelievers and, and kind of be where they are and I won't be affected. I'm strong. No, you're not. Well, Jesus hung with sinners. He was right there. He was in the club with them. I'm not telling you what I think. I'll tell you what I heard. Somebody told me that. <laughs> it's a club that even exists. What are you talking about? Well, he, hang, he hung with sinners. He hung with prostitutes. He hung with all those people who were outcasts. That's true. But the Pharisees came to Jesus, and they asked him a question. Why do you hang out with these people? So here's Jesus giving his opportunity to give his rationale for why he eats and drinks and hangs out with sinners. You know what he said? I came for the sick. 
It's not the sick who need a doctor. I'm sorry. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, the sick who need a doctor, but the sick. I have come to call them to repentance. When Jesus was with them, his whole goal was getting them saved. So when you are with unbelievers, here's the question you have to ask. Is my goal here getting them saved? In other words, Jesus wasn't around them talking and just talking about anything. I'm sure Jesus was always bringing in things about himself, things about the scriptures, things about the synagogue in order to turn their attention to God. So people think, well, I can hang out with sinners, and I just want to be with them and just, and just kind of be there. We always, we always say things like, oh, we just. That's how, that's how we justify things. We just. Why are you with him? Oh, we just friends. <laughs> Where y'all going? We just hanging out. <laughs> Where y'all going? We just getting married. Well, you're right. We just having kids now. It starts small. We just, and then before you know it, we just, we just. <laughs> Saints preserve us. Stop saying, well, we just, you're trying to justify what you're doing. You're trying to justify. Hanging out with, Christ, with non-believers and doing what they do just confuses them. <laughs> I heard a joke, but it's inappropriate, so I can't say it. But it, was <laughs> but it, it, it was about how some people, when they first get saved, how they, they're still trying to figure out, okay, what's, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And they're kind of working through that. And for, for people who just get saved, you need to be in a place where you're not around those other, inf- other kinds of influences because you will go back. Spurgeon tells the story of this guy who his son was saying, I can hang with all those friends of mine at school, and there, there's no problem. So his father said, okay. So he took a, a piece of coal from the fire, he put it on the ground, and he waited for it to cool down. He said, I want you to grab the piece of coal. He said, he said no. He said, why? It's not going to burn you. He said, yeah, but it will blacken me. See, the idea, we're always thinking, we're thinking for this huge thing. Burn, I don't know, burn, no. It's just a little bit of black. And you think, hanging around with your friends, it, not, it doesn't affect you. It does. I can tell you people who have walked through this door who I knew were hanging with people, dating people, and you don't see them anymore. You see them out there, and they're like, I'll be at church Sunday. Those are people, you know those people, you see them, and they know you're from church, and so they think you, they have to say something churchy to you. I saw somebody the other day. I'm walking through the mall. They go, hey, how are you? God bless you. Okay. And they were like, yeah, I'm going in there, and I've been praying about this shopping, and I'm going to go in there, and it's going to be done in Jesus' name. I'm just like, okay. <laughs> I was just going to say, how are you? Merry Christmas. You want to have a prayer meeting. All right. So blessed people steer clear of the advice of the wicked, the behavior of sinners, and thirdly, mockers or sinners' attitudes. So you have their actions, their advice, and now their attitudes. This is a special class of sinners. The mockers or the scoffers, these are those who um, make fun or mock the things of God. They have no respect for the things of God. And the Bible says you need to steer clear of those kind of people. They say, oh, I'm, I'm not around those type of people. Like people who, who love Jesus, those are the people I want to be around. And anybody who mocks or makes fun of God, I'm not around them. But I'm, I, I was thinking about that this week because I think that probably most of us would say something to somebody if they were ridiculing or making fun or mocking our God, we would speak up. But I think sometimes we, when you think about the TV shows that we watch, there's a particular show called Family Guy. And this is not an endorsement of the show, but the writers of that show, me writing plays and doing that kind of stuff, I can recognize good writing and good comedic writing. They do very well on that show writing comedically. And they do very well with their creativity. But I'm not endorsing them just from an artistic standpoint. But one of the things that always has bothered me about that show is they will have certain points in the, the show where they will make fun of Jesus 
showing him in one scene they had him as being in a trailer park and having like 12 kids running around and him yelling, Mary, he has a beer in his hand and a cigarette. And I watched that and I thought, man, they are just mocking my Lord. As if, you know, this, this God, this king cannot kill them at any moment. They reduce him to a joke. And sometimes we watch those shows and we laugh. South Park is another one. And there are other shows that they, they, they take spiritual things about the kingdom, about the Bible, about pastors, about Christians, and they mock them. They make a joke of it. And the Bible says you should steer clear of those kind of people. When they mock the things of God, when they say, ah, God, psh, that's nothing. God, he's, he doesn't, he's stupid. He's, and they, say, they have all these different things that they say about our God and our king. I don't think any of us laughed when you read the story where Jesus was being beaten. The soldiers, the Roman soldiers, they had him. They threw him in this room, and they stripped him of his clothes, and they began to beat him. They blindfolded him. They took a crown of thorns and smashed it on his head. And as they were beating him and making fun, they, they, they stood and said, prophesy who hit you. Blinded him. And then say, you're supposed to be a prophet. We hit you in the face. Now tell us who hit you. And then they start taking the staff and they bow down. Hail, king of the Jews. Making fun of him. Mocking him. It's funny. They didn't know that he was actually the king of the Jews. And was going to come back and probably get them. <laughs> Hopefully they got saved. I don't know. But they mocked him. And those are the kind of things that sometimes we, we sit around and we tolerate. And you notice it goes from walk, stand, sit. Just gets progressively worse. And in our lives, that's what happens. You just start kind of walking around, taking their advice, and then you start kind of doing what they're doing, and then before you know it, you become one of those mockers. You just kind of, shh, I used to go to church. I used to believe in God. There are people who used to be ministers in our church who do not come to church anymore, who do not know God who used to stand in this place and preach. Why? Because they started taking advice, they started following behavior, and then it led into being a mocker of those things. So if we want to be a people who's blessed, number one, we steer clear of sin. Secondly, blessed people meditate on the word of God. Blessed people meditate on the word of God. Look at verse 2. But his delight is in the law of of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. Notice he says his delight. Delight is to find pleasure in something. Delight is when something gives you a great amount of enjoyment. That's what something you delight in. Now I've been observing Christians and I think that we like the Word of God I think we believe that the Word of God is powerful. I think we believe that the Word of God is useful. I think that we believe that the Word of God is the very Word of God. I believe that. But you know what I don't think? I don't think we delight in it. Many of you, if I, if I were to ask you, you think the Bible is a good book? Oh, it's an awesome book. It's the Word of God. You think we should memorize it? Oh, absolutely. Is there power in the Word? Oh, yes, absolutely. Do you delight in it? You might say yes, but I think actually you don't. We don't delight in the word of God. Let me prove it to you. There are, there are some indicators of delight. If you were to say what indicates delight, there are three things I would say. Number one, how do you know you delight in something? The time. How much time do you spend doing that thing? The amount of time you spend doing something will indicate how much you delight in it. There's a video game called Call of Duty. And it's a video game, it's a first person shooter and um, it made over a billion dollars being sold. And one of the things you can do on the game is you can go in and you can see how many hours you've been playing and how many days. The collective amount of hours in one month, all the people playing Call of Duty was over three million. Couple individuals, you can go to their 
to their profile, and you can see how many hours they've been playing. There have been people who've been playing Call of Duties for eight days. No, eight, eight days all together. I know some of them. <laughs> eight days? Playing a game, sitting in front of a screen, going like this? You been doing that for eight days? You delight in that. The average TV amount of watching that a household does every day is eight hours. And the in average individual watches four hours of TV a day. Now somebody's like, I don't watch that, but you remember, I'm, listen to the shows that you watch. Some of your shows are over an hour, plus commercials, and you kind of spread it out. It's very easy to get four hours of TV done in a day. Very easy. You just start watching like, oh, what's this show? And you just keep watching it. The, oh, this show looks cool. You keep watching it. Before you know, four hours has gone by. And then the next day, it just repeats. Eight hours are from a household, four hours individually. The average person who has a Facebook account spends seven hours a month on Facebook. Seven hours a month on Facebook. Now, now some of you have Facebooks, and some of you are listening to this message now on the podcast, and as you're listening to this podcast, you're on Facebook. <laughs> listening to this message. Seven hours? You delight in that. So time is a great indicator of how much you delight in something. You spend a lot of time doing it, it means that you love it. Internet surfing, there are so many things that you can point to that show that you delight in it. A second indicator of your delight in something, not just time, but also your passion. When you do that thing or you come around that thing, are you passionate about it? Compare a church service to a sporting event. You ever been to a 49er game or to a Warriors game? or to a high school game. We went to a 49 We went to Monday Night Football to watch the 49ers play the Saints. And we're up in the stands, and man, when they scored a touchdown, screaming at the top of our lungs, I'm, hiving, I'm high-fiving people I don't know. I thought we were good friends. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, hugging them and stuff. A couple of dudes around us was drunk, but man, we were just like, praise God, the, 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 the Niners are killing it. When they drove down and scored that touchdown, we were screaming. The next day, we had no voice. A lot of us were just like, praise God, hallelujah. Because we were so excited. Now, compare that to a church service. Hands raised. <laughs> What it is. <laughs> now, I'm not telling you that you need to be like a sports fanatic in church. I'm not saying when the pastor comes, ah, 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 just start. that's weird. I'm not saying you do the wave, nothing like that. But what I'm saying, there needs to be some similarities. When people come into our church, they should be able to say, man, you guys have passion. You guys actually care about the words that you're singing on that screen. You ever been to a church where people are singing and you're just like, they don't care? They're just singing because it's up there. Or because the pastor say, let's now sing hymn number, have passion. I went to a worship conference last November, this November, and I was in the, in the crowd, and, and I'm very reserved compared to a lot of you. I'm, I'm not crazy with my worship. You know, I'll move, I'll lift my hands, and I was, so they were doing this song, and I was just, you know, doing my regular thing. It wasn't crazy. And this pastor behind me after was like, we were at dinner, he's like, man, this guy. Oh, no. He was moving and twitching, and he was go he was so bad. I was just like, man, get him on dance fever. And I was just like, <laughs> I'm thinking you're talking about somebody else. I'm like, man, I was not doing anything. I was barely doing this. Lifting my, I was like, I was not doing anything. And so you think I'm crazy. <laughs> I got two words for you, Janice King. <laughs> you, you think, oh man, you want to take a camera out. I got to get a picture of this. <laughs> I 
But she, <laughs> she's, she's passionate. She's passionate. She loves Jesus. And sometimes when you come to, again, this is not, you need to be like everybody else. I, I just saw a friend the other day. I was, I was going to do some Christmas presents, and he was standing out. He said, Shala? It was some man. I haven't seen him play football with him and everything. And he was telling me he, w- he was um, at school in Alabama. He said, man, I, I was telling him, you know, I work at a church now. He said, like, oh, okay, yeah, I went to this church out in Alabama, this Kojic and Baptist. He's like, man. I was like, yeah. They love Jesus. And not, you're not going to, because he grew up Catholic, so he, he was, it was a shock to him to see what happened. <laughs> Especially in the South. Now, some of you have been. I've never been to a church in the South. Now, some of you have. <laughs> I went to a church in Africa, and I was just like, man, let's, let's next thing. Because they, they just kept going, dancing, no, no um, keyboards, nothing like that, just drums. And everybody just going. Passion. Why? Because they cared about those things. So delight. If you delight in something, you, you will have a, a great passion for it. Then, then third, um, priority. What kind of priority do you give to things? When something has priority, you move other things in order to make room for that one thing. You make room. Now, those husbands who do not factor in their wife's opinion in the decisions that they make do not delight in their wife. Now. Your wife is your best friend. Your wife is the one God has given to you to love and to protect, all that stuff. You need to be, in everything you do, you need to be thinking about her. Because there's sometimes we'll be on a Saturday night where it's like, hey, guys, we're going to go watch this movie. It's going to be great. We're going to go at 8 o'clock. And some of the husbands are like, um, I have to check because, um, I was supposed to watch a movie with my wife, something on the Oxygen channel. And so I just, so I was just, I don't know if I can make it. <laughs> they actually, they didn't, because some people are like, oh, I don't care what she does. She can just stay at home, do whatever. Well, you delight, said, I care what my, what my wife thinks. I care about that. Now, out of all those things that we said, your time, your passion, priority, When you apply those things to your love for the word of God, do we delight in it? No. He says, on his law, he meditates day and night. Now, I want you to notice what he doesn't say. In verse 2, he says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law, he, what's the word? Notice he didn't say reads. He didn't say he reads day and night. There is a difference between meditation and reading. I want to quote this writer. He says this, reading reaps the wheat. Meditation threshes it, grinds it, and makes it into bread. Reading is like the ox feeding. Meditation is it digesting when chewing the cud. It is not only reading that does us good, but the soul inwardly feeding on it and digesting it. See, because we think, well, I read my word, but you did not meditate on it. Now, what does the word meditate mean? The word meditate means to mutter. So it'd be like if somebody told you their phone number and you were trying to remember it. So my number is 762-6112. You're trying to find a people. 762-6112, 762-6112, 762-6112, 762. That's meditation. Low voice, muttering beneath your breath, trying to remember that thing that's important. And the Bible says that we are to meditate on the word of God day and night. And the goal of meditation is to cement these ideas into your heart and mind. You ever go to school and see a pole for a tether, for a, a tether ball game or for a flagpole? It's cemented into the ground. Nobody can just come and just move it. And the idea is that you want those truths of God's word to be cemented in your mind. They will not be cemented in there if all you do is skim read it. It's impossible. It will not happen. When I was little, my mom used to make us go through the books of the Bible every single day. 
She would give us five, and when we got those five, we go to the next five. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Next day. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Next day. Until we got it. Now, to this day, I can go through the whole Old Testament books very quickly. Since I was little, because every single day, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Proverbs, Psalm, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Jonah, Michael, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Instead of trying to say it so fast, I just slow down. But I know them. And I have not looked at that in 20 years. It's in there. From a young age, my mom just kept pushing it, kept pushing it. How many of you guys know your debit card number? Of course you know it because you use it all the time. <laughs> no, not your number, not, not for your card. Some of you know that. I, so I talked to somebody the other day. I was like, what's your debit card number? I thought they were going to pull up their card. They're like, four, two, three. I was like, what? I didn't know that. But you know the PIN number. Now, some of y'all know the card number. That's amazing because I don't know that. But you know those things because you use it constantly. The enemy wants to come, and he wants to take the things that we've learned from us. Remember that parable Jesus told about the bird who comes and tries to steal the seed of the word. I think that's what the enemy wants to do. As you guys hear these truths and you're listening to sermons and you, you read your Bible, that the enemy comes and he takes away those things that are so near your heart. You do not have a bad memory. You do not remember stuff because you don't meditate. So he's like, well, you know, my brain, I'm getting so old and now, no. That's not an excuse because there's stuff you remember. You remember where you live. My grandpa always say, I still remember my address. Right. You remember those things that you repeat over and over and over again. There's some rappers who don't need to write down their lyrics. Jay-Z is one of you. You know Jay-Z, he goes into the booth. He doesn't have pen or paper. There's a Christian rapper named Fanatic. What they do is they, they keep going over the same rhyme in their mind over and over. They write one verse, and then they, they keep saying it until they can go to the next one. And then they keep saying those two. And then they keep saying those two plus the third one. And they keep going on and on and on until they know that whole verse. That's meditation. Now, some of us are like, well, I, I don't have time for all that. Then you don't have time to honor God. Because he says on his law, he meditates day and night. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it to you. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. He says, do not let. This book of the law, depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Same idea as in Psalm 2, that when you meditate on the word of God, you will be prosperous and successful. Meditation is important because you can't have the playbook in a game. If, you, if you're a quarterback and and you go out there, and, the, and, and everybody's around. You say, okay, guys, what's the play? You say, where's the playbook? What do you mean, where's the playbook? You're supposed to know that. And a lot of times we get out in the world and are trying to do things, and we do not know God's word. We don't even know the, the, the general vicinity of where something is. We'll say something like, well, I know it's somewhere in the New Testament. It's somewhere in the pastoral epistles or something like that, but you don't know where it is because you don't meditate. You should keep the word of God in your mind like a cough drop. Now, you know, when, you, when, I, when I eat cough drops, I, I bite them too early. I put them in my mouth. Mm. <laughs> you got you to gotta keep it in your mouth so that all of the medicine and all the nutrients can get into your bloodstream. If you don't do that, you will not, you will not get better. That cough will stay the same. And sometimes we take the word of God, ooh, I love you. And God says, no, just, just let it linger. Let your mind marinate in the word of God. I'm trying to be a good cook. I watch the Fruit Channel all the time. And I'm, learning, I'm trying to learn, how do you marinate? And I remember when I first started learning, I thought when you marinate something, you just got to, like, get a little wet. So I remember I want some fish. So I made this marinade, and I put it in for five minutes. Walked away, came back, put that thing in the oven. Like, ooh, this is going to be good. I marinated it. 
And I, oh, <laughs> I ate it. I was like, man, this tastes like I just took it out the river. <laughs> and, and didn't put nothing on it. And I read somewhere said, no, you got to meditate. Meditate. You got to marinate that thing for 24 hours and get all of those flavors in that chicken, in that fish. And all those flavors are now in that fish. And when you eat it, you'll be like, hmm. Sometimes we put our mind in the Word of God like this. Doop. No wonder you don't have the Word in you because you don't meditate, because you just read. I'm trying to push this point because we will not be blessed if all we do is read the Bible. If all we do is just say, we have a book of the month, let's read the book of the month. Now that's good to read that and, and to play the game and all that, but in your own personal time with the Lord, <clears throat> you need to be meditating on his word because it's very, very important. I had a dream. You know how you have a dream sometimes and your dreams Sometimes there are two dreams that are not really related, but then somehow in the dream it makes sense. Some of you don't know what, like, I, I'm like on a mountain dancing, and then next night I'm like in line at Disneyland. But I'm just like, this makes sense in my dream. So this is what happened. I'm at a military base, and I'm driving, and they're like, yeah, you're in the military. I was like, oh, okay. How did I get here? And like, ah, oh, we don't know. So we just kept kept going, and then we get to this this. All of a sudden, I'm behind a curtain, and I realize I'm in a Tyler Perry play. <laughs> and I know I have a great part, but I also know I don't know my lines. So I'm sitting behind there like, oh, Lord, I don't know my lines. I'm in a Tyler Perry play. I'm trying to be famous. And so I was just, oh, give me the script, give me the script. And I'm trying to learn, trying to learn, trying to learn. Then I woke up. And I was like, oh, Lord, that was funny. That was. So I went on Facebook, and I put... You know, hey, guys, just had this crazy dream. <laughs> you know, I was at a teleplay play, <laughs> and I didn't know my lines. And I just kind of, you know, laugh, laugh, laugh. A pastor down in um, San Mateo, Larry Ellis, he messaged me, and he said, Shala, um, the Lord wanted me to tell you that he wants you to study your script more. Uncle Larry. And I said, I cannot believe that. He never, like, we never talk on Facebook. He randomly saw that, and the Lord spoke to him and said that I was using that dream to teach you, you need to study your script, your Bible. Because I'm thinking, I, I know my Bible. I study it all the time. That's what I do. That's what I'm paid for. I, that's, that's what I do. So you need to study it more. And it was confirmed because the Lord had been saying things like that to me for a while. Study more, study more, get in my word more, meditate more. And I was just kind of like, ah, well, you know, I'll get around to it. And then he used a crazy dream that I was just making, you know, light of. Just like, ah, that's funny, funny, funny. And the Lord was using that to show me you need to study your script more. That's not just for me, it's for you too. That we need to study our script more. We need to be in our Bibles more. Not just reading it but meditating on it. How do you do that? Because if you wake up in the morning, you don't know, you know, I, I don't have much time. I don't really know, you know, how long I'm supposed to spend doing this. One of the things that, that I learned is when you read in the Bible and you get to something that's really standing out to you, go to the dollar store, buy some three by five cards, and on those three by five cards, write that verse that stood out to you, that was huge in your life, and write it down, and after you write it down, put it in your pocket, put it in your purse, carry it around with you. When you're standing in line at Safeway, and you're not just pull that thing out and read it. It said, blessed is the man who does not stand in the way of sinners. And just keep reading it, put it back in, sitting in traffic, pull that thing out, read it. By the end of the day, if you keep pulling that thing out, praying that scripture over your family, over you, over your church, over your city, those things will be cemented into your brain. Instead of just doing this, well, I read, I did my devotion in the morning. That's okay. But Jesus is calling us to delight. And he's calling us to delight by meditating. That means you got to continue to continue to marinate your mind in the word of God. And lastly, Blessed people become a blessing. Blessed people become a blessing. 
And before we do that part, I want to say one more thing because sometimes people will tell me, I read the I, I don't read my Bible, but I pray. Because I'll ask them sometimes, hey, you guys been reading your Bible? And say, no, oh, no, but I've been praying. Here's the problem. Prayer is not the food for your soul. If you want to grow, you got to read your word. So if you're just praying, then you won't grow. So some people say, well, I, I, I pray. I don't read my Bible, but I, but I do pray. It won't work. If you look at Scripture, I don't have time to go into this, but the Scriptures are very clear that prayer and the Word of God go hand in hand. That when you have the Word without prayer, the Word dies. And when you have the Word without prayer, the Word dies. <laughs> you guys know what I'm trying to say. They go together. So there's, there, to say, I pray, but I don't read my words shows you don't really, you don't know the scriptures because you got to do both. Okay, lastly, blessed people become a blessing. Look again at verse 3. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Now, why do I say blessed people become a blessing? Because the picture that the psalmist gives is one of a tree and the tree yields fruit. Fruit is never for the tree. Fruit is for others. You ever see a tree eating its own fruit? Yeah. You've never seen that. A tree is always giving its fruit to others. So blessed people become a blessing. So God is growing you and God is blessing you in order for you to be fruitful. I want to read this quote from John Piper because it's, it's awesome. He says this quote, Oh, for more fruitful people. You know them. They are refreshing and nourishing to be around. You go away from them fed. You go away strengthened. You go away with your taste for spiritual things awakened. Their mouth is a fountain of life. Their words are healing and convicting and encouraging and deepening and enlightening. Being around them is like a meal. This is the effect of delighting in the word of God and meditating on it day and night. You will yield fruit in season. I, you know people like this, that when you're around them, you're just like, I want to love Jesus more. I want to I pray more. I want to pray more like that. I, I feel fed. I feel nourished. I feel like I, I gained something. That is the result of people who meditate on the word of God, who don't just read it, because they become a blessing to other people. And so when God blesses you, he's blessing you to be a blessing. That means that job you just got is not just for you. It's for me, too. <laughs> that car you just got is not just for you. It's for me, too. That financial blessing you just got, it's not just for you. It's for me, too. All those Christmas gifts that you got, <laughs> not just for you. It's for me, too. Those plates you just got for your dinner, not just for you. For me, too. I can go on for, for a long time. <laughs> You get the point. Our blessings are not just for us. Yet we think, I'm blessed. It's my season. I'm just doing it. When God blesses you, you naturally become a blessing. In other words, somebody says, be a blessing. Be a blessing. You see a pastor trying to tell you to be a blessing. You should be a blessing automatically. You have to tell a tree, share your fruit. The tree be like, I am. What, do you, what, what else do I do? When you're a blessed person, I, I can tell you, one of the people is my dad. He might have got a gift for everybody in the world. He was carrying out boxes, giving it to everybody. I was just like, I know what he got me. I know what he got my mom. I know what he got my brother. I know what he got everybody else. Like, he has no money. There's no way he has money left. Either that or he's a millionaire and he's not telling us. <laughs> How do you have all this? And he just, I don't know if he stores it somewhere and he just has gifts in a storage. I don't know what it is. <laughs> He's just bringing out coins and cashews and cards and just, like, where is all this stuff coming from? And he just gives. He just gives. God blesses him. He's blessed his family. He's blessed his second son with the ability to play ball. 
and make money? His, his, his youngest sister with the ability to act and do things, his oldest son, the ability to preach, that is a blessing of God. But he continues to give. You ever been around my dad? You know that. He'll just give you stuff. Here. <laughs> my cousin, her, her little kids, he's like, take them to McDonald's and gave them some money. And she thought it was like a dollar. He gave them $20 each. <laughs> he knew what, $20 at McDonald's? You're three years old. That is ridiculous, man. <laughs> Blessed people become a blessing, like Pastor Coyne. And he says they're planted. That word means transplanted. Transplanted means you're taken from one place and you're placed there. By streams of water, too. I, trees that are next to a stream, they can gain their nourishment and their source much easier than a tree from somewhere else. I was reading that most trees takes what, 300 gallons of water a day. And if they're not near a water source, they gotta get it from way below the ground. If you're right next to the river, you can grab it real easily. And we're, we are part of an era, we have so much, the, the word of God is so available to us. You have it here, you can have it on your phone, you can go on the internet and find it. When me, Amani, Kwame, we used to have these little pocket Bible things electronically. You just type in the verse. So we used to all, like, nerds, just sit around like, hi, right, Ezekiel chapter 3, and we just put the thing in there and reading the Bible. But, we, man, the word was there for us. I think we are planted by streams of water, and we have this opportunity to get nourishment from the word of God, but we don't, we don't take advantage of that. God has taken us, transplanted. You're taken from darkness into light. He placed you there in order for you to gain nourishment. And I want you to, to see also, he says that his leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers, because blessed people are durable. They're durable. Brett Favre, he's a quarterback for the Vikings now. He's been with three teams. And he just ended a streak where he had 297 consecutive starts. I don't know if you know anything about football. Football is a violent sport. And most quarterbacks do not make it through a season without getting injured. Many miss game, a game two, three, here, there. This guy's been playing 297 games. He just got hurt two weeks ago and, and missed that game. But for years, I think he started in 1992, never missed a start. That's durability. There's another guy, Cal Ripken. I know you guys remember him. He played shortstop and third base for the Orioles. He had 2,632 games he played straight. He never didn't play for, I don't forgot how many years it was, but it was over 2,000 games. Durability. Those people who are blessed are people who, who endure. They're not people who are here today, and then tomorrow you don't see them. Because some people are like, oh, I love Jesus, he's my Lord and Savior, but you don't see him. We need more spiritual Brett Favre's and Cal Ripkins, people who stick with it. I really believe God wants to bless you this year. But there are some things you got to do. So as we go into 2011, I'm praying God's blessing for you, and I'm also asking that the Lord would help us, if we're not those things, to become those things. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for your blessing. You have been so good to us. And so we thank you that you are using your word to help us. And Lord, I pray you would give us a love for your word. Lord, it, it's, it's something you have to do. If you don't give us that love for your word, we won't have it. So as we go into 2011, God bless our socks off. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.